uh, you know, I would, I would say, all I could say was no comment. I don't know. I wasn't alive then. I had nothing to do with it. My sympathy is all with the Indians. All countries do the same thing. I mean, this late this fellow named Hitler doing it, Stalin. Genocide seems to be a commonplace. This is a New England town built because a guy once had the guts to say that your religion is your own business and to do something about it. Not that that idea is new to the other 47 states, but here's where it started. And here's the guy, Roger Williams, who left the Puritan colony of Massachusetts and founded Providence. Rhode Island goes to war. Reserves and V-12s cram on how to stay alive in historic halls where once men learned how to live. Brown, first university to state in its charter that men of all faiths must be free to enter. Well, I moved to Patuxent Village, well, near to Edgewood anyway, in 1972 uh, on Albert Avenue. But we only lived there about a year and a half, and then we moved to Ocean Avenue, right in the heart of Patuxent Village, historic Patuxent Village. Because Patuxent Village is a beautiful place to live, and it's a wonderful place to uh, raise children. We, we uh, always would go to the parade every year, and uh, uh, our daughter was in one of the floats uh, on one occasion, so we always enjoyed it. It was a time for the neighbors to gather and, uh, of course, discuss that historic event and to um, uh, have a clam bake. The Brown family, as you know, the, the came with Roger Williams and so they were here a hundred years before they rose to pro prominence. Um, they owned the strip. Roger divided the land up from Providence River going up basically where Governor is now and so they had a strip like everybody else. During that first hundred year span with them they did it all including financing Slater at Slater Mill, which is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So uh, from 1735 coming up to 1850, the Brown family builds a real juggernaut of a business. And they do a little agriculture, manufacturing, they create the largest candle works factory in America made them in the world, but certainly in the United States. And you have to think how important that is. That's the age of candles and quality candles. They made the best candles in America. So they, they made a fortune from candles, a small fortune from farming, and then of course they got into shipping and made a real fortune. You know, go back to the Browns and, uh, and, and China and, uh, you know, all this uh, cocaine and uh, going into China and forcing this stuff on their citizens. That they were running uh, drugs uh, uh, halfway around the world, uh, that is not yet talked about. So uh, who started the drug trade in America? <laughs> you know, you couldn't even dream this up. Well, the interesting feature of 
uh, the, the, the trade in from the 17th century up till the third quarter of the 18th century when the gas trade took place is that uh, the whole entire east coast of America has to be reconfigured as a maritime nation and we barely penetrated to the west so maritime trade was how uh, this country was formed even even be in the 16th century uh, when fishermen from England came to the Isles of Shoals and off the coast of Portsmouth and then of course the uh, 17th century when it was a British colony but it was all about trade uh, Roger Williams just in addition to all of his other uh, activities in religion and politics was fundamentally a trader and the trade was all seaborne sea uh, you know uh, up and down the bay and of course across the Atlantic because you have to also realize this is the beginning of globalization. Well, when we finally get to the gas bay, look at the history that we have to really seriously incorporate. Slavery was already extant. Uh, we've gone through being a British colony, uh, the intense r personal rivalries within the Brown family, between the Browns and, the, and American slavers and the English. So all of that history and the competitiveness and the politics of it, uh, it has to be you know, contextualized. It was about con contestation over the globalized maritime trade, which from the Rhode Island point of view included the slave trade and the rum trade and the beginning of manufacture. So these are the the various, let's say, arcs or legs of the triangle where manufactured items, including uh, glassware, metalware, and that type of thing, uh, and especially rum, back to Africa and the, the shipping of slaves, because in Rhode Island, um, since it was a northern area, the growing season was relatively short, uh, although there were slaves here for domestic use and slaves here mostly as a commodity that were shipped on Rhode Island ships. So all these factors and forces were coming to play on the night of June, uh, uh, you know, 1772. Uh, who was going to control that trade? Uh, that, that's what the, the, the context was about. Uh, very locally, very specifically, it was about the rum trade, mm -hmm. which was the lubricant, literally, and the currency for barter in the slave trade back to West Africa and to make Rhode Islanders drunk. And the British wanted to dominate that trade, so that's what the taxes were about to control. The, and that represented an undermining of the uh, fairly rapacious, you know, drunken, literally drunken economy of the patriots uh, who became the, you know, the, the, the anti-British, anti-Tory, anti-colonialist power. So those are the, the highlights, uh, what was being contested, why it was being contested. It wasn't just the, the first time that it had been contested by any means, as we would see later on with the, with the tea trade and the, you know, the guerrilla theater of the Boston Tea Party, which uh, clearly took place a bit after the singing of the gas bay. After the conspirators had met in Sabin Tavern on Water Street, uh, there's a stone marker there which one can see where the site was. 
and then they rowed down in long boats because they had heard that the gas bay had run aground. So they think, figured, well, this is a great time to uh, assert our, you know, resistance. We, you know, the blow for freedom. Well, it was a blow for the freedom for white slavers, but it certainly wasn't a blow for freedom for African people, because this was led by John Brown and his fellow conspirators. Uh, so Aaron Briggs, you know, is known about, and there's 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 a good bit of documentary evidence because of the uh, because of the trial. Uh, but you know, he was a young, um, indentured male of African descent uh, who was a uh, 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 enslaved by Capul Captain Samuel Tompkins, Providence, and who was um, probably pressed into service on the night of the uh, of the incident uh, involving the attack on the gas bay, the, the um, grounded gas bay. So uh, according to the trial, you know, he was uh, in the boat and probably helped to row the boat out to, uh, to, the, to the gas bay. And therefore that makes him a, uh, you know, a party to the offense from the British side. But, but uh, like uh, Christmas addicts, uh, when we discuss this, you know, it raises the contradictions that you that you find in the American Revolution, of being both seeking and assisting in the liberation of the colonies and being essentially unfree. So, uh, Aaron Briggs has got a very interesting early uh, complexity of race in America, because he is Afro-Indian. He's Native American as well as as a person of African descent. And so already, you know, there's a piece of this that, that needs to be included, which involves Native American history, American Indian history, as well as uh, African history and African American history. Uh, he was described as a, well, first of all, an indentured servant. And so the term slave, and I don't want to split hairs here, but he was an indentured servant. You know, sometimes this could be confused with slavery, actual slavery. But this was a form of debt bondage, uh, which, you know, the majority have actually poor white immigrants were in the early. So this is another part of the racial piece which makes it both more engaging, more interesting, and more complex. So it's not the whole business of, of uh, black or mulatto means, you know, necessarily slavery. It was a status of being unfree and indentured was part of also of our American Revolution. So he's a mixed uh, heritage referred to as a, a so-called mulatto, a term which I hate and I always speak about with my students in Race and Racism, you know, is derived from mule, which is the term, you know, for the infertile offspring of a, a donkey and a, and, and a horse. The term which, is, which was in use at the time was musty, M-U-S-T-E-E, -E, for persons of, of mixed race uh, background. And apparently, he might have, I've been doing a little more reading, he might have actually been born free, but was then, you know, put into indenture because many children uh, of mixed race background at that time were in fact put into indenture because of their uh, because of their mixed race background. So uh, that's that's the that's the sort of racial picture of of, uh, of Aaron Briggs. As the trial unfolds, when those who were implicated were attempted to be brought to justice, uh, Aaron Briggs plays a very interesting role in terms of where he was. Uh, who says what about where he was. Uh, two of the uh, persons who apparently he bunked with were, you know, described as Negro, one a mulatto, one a Negro slave, um, you know, who testified to the fact that he was in his bed all night and he couldn't possibly have been there. And then there is some, at least, allegation that perhaps he was whipped by a person named Captain Lindsay who forced him to basically, you know, give uh, this account. Of, of what happened on the on the night of the burning of the gas bay. The other thing which is interesting in terms of race, this complexity of race, is that um, he was apparently seated next to, after Captain Dunningston was shot and was brought aboard the ship, uh, he, uh, 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 he apparently was seated next to Dunningston because he quote-unquote looked Indian, and part of the whole story that they had conduct, uh, concocted at the Sabin uh, Tavern was that this was not going to be some, this wasn't something the colonialists, uh, you know, did, but this was something that that the uh, you know the Indians sort of uh, 
perpetrated against the uh, against the British. There's a significant piece of this that that also belongs with Native American history. You know, Indians were already you know significantly othered and had been. You know, it was pretty much uh, the beginning of the end in terms of what was going to happen with respect to ultimately, you know, genocidal uh, uh, approach to, uh, to to the native peoples here. Uh, and so, this early calculated use of Indian identity uh, in in a in a in a in a in a strategically deploying this strategically as part of their of their military uh, uh, you know, approach to defeating the, the British colonialists. His attempt that night, um, as you will tell the story, as the story is told, um, to emancipate himself. But after the uh, events took place, he realized, because he was on the scene, that this, uh, this ship was grounded and it wasn't going to go anywhere. But he also was, you know, thinking about, well, this is an opportunity to perhaps emancipate myself. Because these folks are fighting my master. He had already attempted to escape one time before. Uh, why not, you know, try to throw my my lot in with the uh, the enemy of my, which we say, my my master, um, and so he attempted. He apparently rode out again, sometime between when the incident took place and four o'clock in the morning, when he was reported to be back in his quarters, uh, and assessed, no doubt, assessed the uh, seaworthiness, you might say, of of, of the Gatsby and decided that maybe he would have been stuck on that ship, <laughs> which wasn't going anywhere. Uh, but it was an effort, you know, really to self-emancipate. And something that is not, um, it's completely understandable in not only this day and age, but that as well. That someone uh, who was in indenture, who was akin to a slave, uh, would have been, uh, would have been uh, in a situation where uh, he could have uh, attempted to alter the circumstances. 16-year-old young man, you know, he had another eight or ten years of indenture ahead of him. He was making his calculated possible gains and losses, and I would have done the same thing. You know, since um, all, all of historic events have their antecedents and precedents and so forth, um, one of the important, uh, the two most important dates of the 17th century uh, were the 1636 Pequot War, where Roger Williams, who had just immediately formed Providence, uh, did choose sides, and he used the Narragansetts to help destroy the Pequots. And they were sold as slaves from Rhode Island into into the Caribbean um, and uh, and even uh, elsewhere. Uh, the next de de decisive moment was 100 years before the sinking of the Gas Bay, but the 1675 Narragansett War, King Philip's War, and once again, uh, this was the sort of er final eradication of the Indian problem, let's put it that way. I'm an Amaro Rhode Island College professor, and many, many of the unsung heroes and heroines of this particular story are Rhode Island College students, and you know, their names, some of them are on a little pamphlet, but others are, 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 are uh, you know, will be forgotten, and especially since Brown University, which was tailing on this as you know, officially telling its own story now that it you know has finally come to terms with its history of slavery, uh, we were way ahead of them. So they're they're retelling the story. This is a nice opportunity to be able to set the record straight. So we were attending at the Condon Street Church, I believe. It was a lecture about slavery somewhere else, and I think I not think I know. I got up and I said, you know, it's about time we basically got to the bottom of and told the, the truth, the story about. Um, Brown University and John Brown, and his his uh, attitude towards slavery and and uh, his um, his not only being a slave trader but even after years after it had been outlawed in Rhode Island, he continued to to uh, to pursue this this trade. Uh, John Brown had six to eight slaves at any given time in that house or connected to the John Brown House on Benefit Street. Mm -hmm that the Brown brothers, uh, Joseph, Moses, uh, John, and Nicholas, had the first co-op slaves. They belonged to the four brothers together, and they passed them around. Uh, it's, it's, uh, these were entrepreneurial types. Because slavery was still extant at the time Brown University, or Rhode Island College, as it was called at first, um, was built, donations could be made and accepted 
in form of labor. So literally slaves, like the, like the White House, uh, when it was first built, it was built in part by, by actual slaves. Today, Brown University is considered one of the premier academic institutions, having recently expanded its campus into downtown Providence's former jewelry district, so to build a state-of-the-art medical training center for doctors. I think they're resistant. Uh, I, I don't think, I know. Mm -hmm. I met with uh, two of the, you know, of the older members, and they asked me to be cautious about how I talk about the Browns and slavery, and they're always reminding me that Moses Brown and, and uh, Ives, uh, um, that Ives, that they were abolitionists, and, you know, and, and, and John gets the bad rap, and it's a complicated family with, hundred plus members of standing, you know, in this 200, 300 year period. The, the Sally uh, set off to be just a normal slave trading expedition, nothing particularly new and different. It was normal that you would lose 20% of your slaves through disease, through suicide, through uh, violence and so forth. So this was the expected casualty rate in the Middle Passage. Uh, uh, on one hand, Moses Brown, one of the brothers, um, uh, had invested as if it were a normal slave voyage, but he lost heart. And then from being a slave trader, uh, he became an, a strong advocate of the abolitionist movement and, and converted to you know, Quakerism. So William J. Brown writes one of the most fabulous narratives by a free man of color ever and he links his family with the Browns going back to the eight, to the, I'm sorry, to uh, 1764. So. I was born in the town of Providence, state of Rhode Island, November 10th, 1814. The house in which I was born was situated on the street running from Power to William Street, the house standing on the southwest corner of a lot belonging to Dr. Parton Bowen. My father's name was Noah Brown. His father was Cudge Brown and his mother, Phyllis Brown. Grandfather Brown was born in Africa and belonged to a firm named Brown Brothers, consisting of four named respectively, Joseph, John, Nicholas, and Moses Brown. They held slaves together, each brother selecting out such as they wish for house service, the rest of the slaves to perform outdoor labor. I have never been able to ascertain the date of grandmother Jeffrey's marriage, but I learned that she purchased her husband from the white people in order to change her mode of living. It was customary for the woman to do all the drudgery and hard work indoors and out. The Indian men thought it a disgrace for them to work. They thought they did their part by hunting and procuring game. The Indian women observing the colored men working for their wives and living after the manner of white people in comfortable houses felt anxious to change their positions in life. Not being able to carry out their designs in any other way, resorted to making purchases. This created a very bitter feeling among the Indian men against the blacks. My father, during his youth, worked on the farm belonging to Moses Brown, and at one time had occasion to find fault with his food, which displeased Mrs. Brown very much. She was accustomed to save all their turkey cartridges until they were musty, and then make soup for the men. So every morning they were treated to some musty soup for breakfast. Week after week, this was continued, and no one dared say anything for fear of offending someone. One morning, after the horn had been blown for breakfast, Father came in, in advance of the men, and looking on the table, beheld the soup and exclaimed, Musty soup again, damn the musty soup. Then, to his surprise, he saw Mr. Brown partly behind the door, wiping his hands. What did thee say, my boy? said Mr. Brown. I said, musty soup, said father. Is that soup 
Must he? said Mr. Brown. Yes, sir, said Father. Mr. Brown ordered a spoon and tasted of the soup, which he ordered to be put into the swell. By this time, the field hands had come in. Mr. Brown asked them how long they had been eating musty soup. They replied several weeks in secession. Mr. Brown sent for his wife to come into the kitchen and said to her in the presence of the men, Is not my house able to give my help good victuals? Here you have been feeding them week after week on musty soup. I have tasted it. It is fit for nothing but for hogs. I don't wish you to give them any more such stuff. They work hard and should have good victuals, and I am able to give it to them. Then to the men he said, Why did you not speak to me about your victuals? You have been going on week after week and said not a word until this boy had to speak for you. Hereafter, if everything is not right, come to me. After Mr. Brown's departure, his wife called my father a black devil and said he should not sleep with the men any longer, but should have his lodgings in the attic room. This was quite a severe punishment to my father, as he was compelled to retire soon after 8 o'clock. Mr. Brown, my grandfather's master, seemed well satisfied with his help, and thought that although they were his property, yet they had amply paid for themselves by their labor, and hence wrong for him, being a Christian man, to confine them any longer in certitude. Also, Mr. Knight Dexter had slaves, but entertaining the same opinion concerning the system of holding property in human beings, they both emancipated them. This was some time before the general emancipation in the state. My grandfather then drew wages for his labor. He saved his earnings and purchased a lot of Mr. Brown, situated on Only Street. They sold land at that time by the running foot. He bought over 100 feet in width of Mr. Brown and 30 feet of Mr. Carlisle, adjoining the lot he had purchased of Mr. Brown. Father said to Mr. Brown, his father had paid for the land but had received no deed. He came with his father one time for the deed. You told us to come again. You could not attend to it then. Mr. Brown replied, I recollected but did not think about it when I sold the lot. Now as your father lived in my house for a good many years, I guess we're about square, but there is a strip ten feet wide. I will give that to you. And that was all my father received. This was the land which my grandfather once owned, somewhere about 150 feet in width, now narrowed down to 40 feet in width. Mm. Did he pay him well to work for him? Uh, he gives him a piece of land and then he takes most of it back. So we have, we have a very complicated story here, and even Moses, the good guy, um, I'm not saying he wasn't, and by the standards of that day, he was. But he, Moses, is painted as a saint. John's painted as evil. Patrick Kennedy took me to meet Nelson Mandela one day in Boston, and you could feel the goodness. Um, I'm sure that would not have happened with Moses Brown. So uh, we said, well, the place to start is at the John Brown House. And uh, there, if we can get them to tell the story straight, then that will be the opening to this whole story. Uh, so we s requested a uh, meeting with the Rhode Island Historical um, Commission or Society, and we requested that we meet at the John Brown House. And for that meeting, we gathered many of the people who are already active on this question. Students have been taking race and racism. Students are interested in uh, the whole uh, matter of race. Uh, and we met at their seminar table in the John Brown House. And we said, well, we'd really like to um, ask you to critically think about the way you t present this house to the public. Because when you come into this house, you hear all about John Brown, the China trader, you hear all about the wonderful uh, 
uh, furniture that uh, one of these very prosperous uh, merchants uh, was able to accumulate. And you see all of these lovely things, you know, the pineapples out front, so that means, you know, Eastern trade, uh, and there's all this chinaware from all over the East. What about uh, the guinea trade? What about the slave trade? And we said this house, you know, is really part of, of that whole history. Well, we always wanted the story to be told, just the truth but all parts of the truth, not just a little of this truth and overlooking that truth and so forth. Uh, but the John Brown House was uh, uh, not interested in that particular narrative. They wanted to make him a heroic figure and maybe he did a little bit of slaving on the side and so forth. Well, that wasn't the view that we had. And they responded, this house has nothing to do with the slave trade. Uh, one of our students, an undergraduate at the time, said, why this house was built on slavery. He said, you just have to look at the dates. And that's when John Brown was the most active, uh, you know, slave trader, one of the leaders in the state. Not the biggest one, but you know, certainly a leading slave trader. This house was built on that wealth. Uh, my own point of view is that it was always fundamentally integrated, not disintegrated or marginalized as an add-on, but it was a fundamental, essential part. Uh, you know, not just the slaves, uh, coming and going, but all of the subsidiary industries. So uh, he, he would argue, well, the population of Rhode Island slaves was something between 5, 7, 12, 15 percent, depending upon which time and which place. So that proves to him that it was marginal. Well, the slave trade, the only, only part of the slave trade has slaves in it. There's all the other parts uh, that are involved and particularly when slaves were principally unloaded in Charleston on Rhode Island ships. Um, then as for John Brown, um, I see him as fundamentally incorrigible and an ardent apologist for slavery. Uh, the famous debate between his brother Moses that took place in the precursor of the Providence Journal, he said slavery is basically good for Americans and his brother Moses, after having been in the slave trade initially, said, no, this is basically bad for America. It's, it's, an, it's a moral cause and you should not do this anymore. Uh, so we continued to try to meet with them. And we brought in some very uh, um, notable persons of African descent who, who were, were um, you know, activists on the local scene and tried to sort of advance this. Uh, but really met with a lot of uh, a lot of resistance. It took 18 months, and frankly, um, here's where the heroic work of the uh, Rhode Island College students come in. They would say, well, we're changing the tour. We're, we're mentioning the slave trade. So what we would do is we would send students in to take the tour. And almost you could predict it. If it was white students going in, they'd get the standard, John Brown, the China trade, John Brown, you know, one of the great patriots, John Brown, the leader, you know, the Gatsby incident, uh, but no, no mention of the slave trade. We said, hey, we should mix this up a little bit, so let's start adding, you know, student of African descent with the, with the people coming in. So you'd have, you know, one black student, two in white, something like that. And then there'd be a little bit of, well, and he might have perhaps, you know, maybe with the West Indies for a little bit of time, had something to do with the slave trade, just mentioned <laughs> in passing. And they'd say, well, I think there's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> and so this went on. I mean, really, there are just literally dozens of students who took on these roles, you know, playing innocent, paying the admission, you know, to take this tour, and then to question. Uh, and oftentimes, they would not get to the whole point of slavery. This was a real uh, theme in their, in their, their treatment. Uh, until they'd get upstairs to the, uh, some of the family quarters, and they would have the opportunity to talk about Moses Brown. So they wouldn't talk about John Brown, they'd talk about Moses Brown, and that Moses Brown had, you know, true to the family's goodwill, become an abolitionist. But they never mentioned that Moses Brown, you know, was fighting his brother, John Brown, the slaver, you know, right up through these, uh, through, through the period of the American Revolution and, and, and beyond. So it was just ducking and dodging and, 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 and really in denial about this core issue. So we pursued and we pursued, and we had, you know, quite honestly, some polite at the beginning, but as their intransigence, I mean, we're now a year into these meetings, you know, by the 13th month, the 15th month, we're getting a little bit impatient, 
And so some of the sessions got to be confrontational. And I'd say, you know, I don't like to do that, but it's the way it had to happen. And so we just really started bringing more and more people to the table who knew what the truth was uh, and who basically said, that's just wrong, that's incorrect, that's denial, that's misrepresentation, that's false. Uh, and just pressing and pressing and pressing. And then even after legislation was passed, he continued to go on and slave until finally the deal was uh, that he would finally give up slaving and then they would not prosecute him for the act of slaving. The linchpin was getting a plaque from the Rhode Island uh, uh, Black Heritage Society which said on it, John Brown, patriot, blah, 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 but slave trader. Two words, slave trader, to put that on the wall of the John Brown house. Which of course is periodically defaced by vandals and they typically focus on the slave trade part, like they can change history by putting paint over those few letters. Uh, we had a very dramatic uh, installation of this plaque where we had people, you know, descendants of slaves and descendants of slave owners. You know, people from the Parks Administration, and, you know, from the Historical Society, very prominent members of the uh, African American community, and, you know, those of us who were deeply involved with getting this date. And we had people, you know, speechifying. We had people pouring libations. <laughs> and I remember looking inside, you know, the, the staff at the, at the John Brown House, they're sort of looking out and afraid even to come out and, and, and join what was really a, a, a celebration of being able to acknowledge this complicated history. So uh, the tension even to the day of, uh, you know, that the plaque went up, which was actually I think Emancipation Day um, in 2001, um, it was, the, the tension was there right up to that point. Well initially, and in speaking with professors in earlier times before this dialogue took place, they would informally be informed that uh, just you don't talk about it. Um, and I've had people tell me exactly that, who are professors, that we just kind of don't talk about that. It's unwritten. Um, but uh, once it became, uh, you know, this can of worms, and you couldn't put those worms back in the can, and they wanted to control the narrative. They marginalized the African-American, Africana faculty. They were generally not involved. Rhode Island Black Heritage Society was slightly involved because we just couldn't, they couldn't help but including us. I was pretty much not involved whatsoever because they knew I was, you know, had a, the view that I've been describing. Um, so they put people in charge of the narrative and to make it look like Brown was leading the way towards the discovery of this remarkable fact. Uh, and we're saying, you are not leading the way and it wasn't really much discovered. You've just been repressing it. And I don't have any particular uh, notes or information about why Ruth Simmons, the first black person whose grandfather was a slave, why she was hired and paid this huge amount of money. I have no idea about that. Uh, but I know she never came to the John Brown House meetings, even though her personal house is about 50 or 100 feet away. Um, and I suppose she was hired because it made Brown more unassailable. Uh, and that w they were very panicked. That I can absolutely tell you for sure, because I did speak personally with people from the Brown family, the Nicholas Brown family, and they were in a state of great distress that this dialogue, much repressed, had finally come out. They were afraid that Brown would be stigmatized, that it would be shameful for Brown, that they'd invested tens of thousands of dollars in endowments and they were feeling threatened and so consequently um, it, was a, it was a challenging time. There were several public forums in which, uh, which I attended in the audience because I was uh, not invited to be on the panels. 
in which they spoke with anguish and fear and anger. There were some African-American students at Brown who were uh, puzzled. How could this even be? And why didn't they even know before? And because now the facts are so easily, you know, discovered. And there is no point to try to say that John Brown wasn't enslaving, and even though that essentially is part of the you know, the dismissive minimalism marginalization approach of the former paradigm. It's impossible, you know, to go back to something like that. Um, but they definitely want to keep their hands on the throttle, on the, on the control panel of who's going to tell the story. Um, Black Heritage Society could have been supported by them, and Brown has never reached out to try to mm -hmm. help us or something like that. Um, they do have their Africana studies. They do have, uh, you know, affirmative action and normal things that institutions have. But they were not racing to it, that's for sure. But the irony is that had they just been more open and receptive, this never needed to be so contentious. Because it, we're just looking at the facts. We're, I don't have any crusade against Brown. I don't care one way or another. I mean, it's just an institution, fine Ivy League institution. And one, uh, I do care about the truth. And if it's um, a manufactured mytholo mythological approach to the truth, as, a, as an academic and as an intellectual, it just offends me. Now we're talking about the report. It has problems. Um, if you read closely, which is what you're supposed to do with a text, a report, um, it's not, they don't apologize, but they're not all that forceful. So they present something, and it's almost academic, and the writing's very good, and so you think you're reading, I don't know, narrative, not fiction, but uh, something between fiction and truth. And remember, a lot of this history has never been um, discussed or unearthed in, in a big way. Um, the building of the edifice, you know, University Hall, and they make it very clear that uh, black folks, slaves, worked on it. I thought they could have done a little more research, um, you know, I, I think we were excited because nothing like it exists. The university, uh, President Simmons was bold in um, dreaming it up, authorizing it, creating the mechanism to have it done, financing it. So you go around and go, wow. But the truth is, it's a Ford and I wanted a Cadillac or a Lincoln. And it's just a standard Ford. Now it's always going to look good and feel good into someone at Princeton or Dartmouth or someplace does it right. And I don't know when that's going to be. So I think this is a B minus document, B for Brown, and I wanted an A. Well, there's only so much that you can do with the truth, and it's been a while since I've read the report. But really all I want to say is that were it not for the huge piece that we were a part of uh, with the opening of the John Brown House, that was really the linchpin that opened up the committee on, uh, you know, dealing with the whole history of slave enslavement. Um, you know, I don't want to be overly critical of that, but I mean, I would have my private criticisms. There were certain key people who were not involved with that, that committee, and might have taken it to another level. Um, it was very much contained. I think Brown University was quite concerned about reparations, because if you look at the only suit that was ever filed on reparations, um, John Brown was mentioned, Providence Bank was mentioned, and his descending bank, which is the Fleet Bank. I think there was a concern that unless this was dealt with and contained, confronted and contained, and either scholarship set up or whatever, you know, the, the compensating mechanisms that they put into place, that they would have had a much larger problem. Uh, and I'm sure lawyers spend a lot of time thinking about this, as well as, uh, I, I wish, let me just say this, I wish that more of the Brown University faculty and um, 
students and of the community was had been with us. They really were not. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line to me is that they were just tailing how well they get to tell their story and probably, you know, except for events like this, uh, you know, Brown University confronted its own legacy and confronted its history and did a really good job of it. But they were kind of dragged kicking and street screaming um, because of what had preceded uh, their opening up of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I do think the whole question about reparations and that being linked to some financial compensation or some of some um, action on the part of those who were judged quote unquote guilty um, had something to do with it. It feels better than it is. And, uh, you know, somebody who's a good writer wrote it. But it's missing a lot. It, it needed, and within the report, it needed to say that this was evil, and that doesn't appear. It is only a factual, uh, unsubstantial, factual report that looks like it's substantial. Now, have you ever been with someone who's a good designer? Well, Brown had a good designer. They had good layout, they had good photos, a uh, good writer. It's quality. But if you read between the lines, there's too much moderation. My favorite political quote comes from Barry Goldwater, mm -hmm. the conservative senator, presidential candidate from Arizona. Um, Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in pursuit of happiness is no virtue. So what happens to Aaron Briggs after this incident and, and the trial and all of that? Uh, he sort of disappears. Uh, and there are uh, there is an Aaron Briggs who you know was attached to the Briggs family, which you know potentially uh, he might be buried in uh, 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 in that family cemetery. Uh, but there's also an Aaron Briggs who might have been part of the Rhode Island Black uh, Battalion, and he might have been actually a fighter in the Revolutionary War and may have emigrated out to uh, upstate New York, the Adirondack area, where also, by the way, John Brown had significant holdings uh, and ended up dying there. So it was not, we're not certain whether he's buried in Rhode Island or buried somewhere else or whether the name Briggs was actually Biggs. And so there's really a trail. It, it, it sort of, the, the trail goes very cold after the trial. But uh, I'm sure there are answers, and we just have to, you know, pursue them outside of Rhode Island, no doubt. So the question is: Is Aaron Briggs um, a hero? Absolutely. You know, he was in the boat. He rode out there. He may have been the person who handed the uh, the gun to shoot the captain, Captain Duddingston. We're not sure. He is a hero. He's a complex hero, like all of our uh, founding fathers and mothers. They are like our first six presidents who were heroic uh, in the foundation of the republic. For example, Thomas Jefferson, who uh, you know, were all slave uh, owners, slaveholders. Big difference between George Washington, who emancipated his slaves at his death, and Thomas Jefferson, who did not. Mm -hmm. So that's a complex view of our presidents. You know, will that complexity will be there? Uh, what do I do? Here's an opportunity. How am I going to take advantage of this opportunity? He had already tried to escape once. What are my What are my chances? Uh, this, this is kind of good that you know the British you know uh, are are being kicked out. But what, what, what's what's in this for me? What's in this revolution and this emancipation for me? Mm. Uh, it's it's uh, it's again the American story told and retold and retold. So there's so much more to be uh, to to be interpreted here and to be taught. Uh, and to be considered for our complex origins as, a, as the first anti, successful anti-colonial revolution, uh, but for all of the heroic moments and all the flaws that that represents, uh, being a, 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 a revolution for freedom, while at the same time a large portion of its population, resident population, was unfree and remained unfree until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 and remains unfree in terms of social status up till today. Brown, first university to state in its charter that men of all faiths must be free to enter. But peacetime life isn't all gone. 
With parents out at war plants, kids all over the country have run wild. But not here. Boys' clubs are a provident standby, and they've doubled their efforts now. Swimming meets, pet shows like this one, and especially sandlot baseball, which the cops set up, have more than held their own against Joe's pool room.